I'll make a start, folks, by singing. I'm going to sing him 332. Come, Holy Spirit, God and Lord, be all thy graces now outpoured on the believer's mind and soul to strengthen, save, and make us whole. So verse 3 really is helpful for tonight. I'm going to seek to carry on from this morning providentially. That's very helpful that we may love no stranger's creed, nor follow other teachers' lead, but Jesus for our master own and put our trust in him alone. That's, that's great, that really is. Lord, as we think and consider how we can go on and how we can grow in grace, how we can be more conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ, how we can seek his face, how we can enjoy all that you have for us in him, how we can know that we are complete in him, how we can know that you freely give us all things in him. We pray tonight that these thoughts about this matter, based on what the Lord Jesus said, might be helpful to us in walking the Christian path with the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you'd help each one of us tonight. As we've already prayed, we pray it again, Lord, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we do pray for others tonight that a meeting in the name of Jesus, you'd help them wherever they are. Do strengthen them, do provide for them. Those that are on their own at home who'd love to be out, we pray for them, those in hospital, those who are aged and infirmed, Lord, those who have responsibilities with children, we pray you'd meet their needs tonight. We thank you for the challenge this morning. 
Lord, we thank you that we are to go on. We are to develop. We are to show signs of it. We are to produce fruit. Lord, we do pray these things might be very real and earnest to us in our own lives. Lord, if there's anybody in this particular fellowship, Lord, that has particular needs tonight that we do not know about, we pray that you would help them and draw near to them. Those that need a word of assurance, those that are perplexed, those that have lost their way. Whatever the needs are of your people tonight, Lord, in this particular fellowship and elsewhere, we pray earnestly that you'd meet their needs in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are thankful that we can come in his name and we don't come in any denominational name. We come in the name of the Lord Jesus. We're thankful for that. And as we've been reminding this hymn, it's him and him alone that we follow. <laughs> Help us not to follow the deceitful natures of our own hearts. Help us not to follow the world. Help us not to follow the latest spiritual fashion. Help us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to seek him. We thank you that his blood does cleanse us from all sin. We confess tonight that we are sinners but we rejoice in the fact that we have a saviour, someone who has met our need in his own person on the tree. We thank you that he ever lives to make intercession for us and that one glorious day we will see him and most wonderful, we shall be like him. Lord, thrill our hearts with these truths tonight, we pray. Pray for myself, Lord, that you would allow me to speak with my voice. Do give me strength in my chest and my voice, I pray. And we pray for the Spirit's work in all our hearts tonight. For we know without the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ here, without the presence of the Spirit, then we meet to no avail. So come, most gracious Lord, and do us good. We ask this in the name of our precious Lord. Amen. Um, this is going to come and read to us. John chapter 9, verses 35 to John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them from and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Thank you. Seven, seven, oh. Seven, seven, oh. Um, this is one of those hymns where it's a, a hymn of, I think, aspiration in a sense. All the way my Saviour leads me. That's what we desire, isn't it? I mean, none of us here can actually say that, but that's what we desire. We desire that, and so we sing it like that. We sing it as a prayer. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>
going to talk about SI tonight. SI. Any ideas? It's not AI. It's not AI, there's the hint. It's not AI. That's QI. <laughs> Is it what, sorry? Not sovereign intelligence, you've got you, you're the 50% there. Intelligence. Oh, well done, yes. But yeah. it's going to, I'm going to talk about spiritual intelligence because that's where this morning leads, in a sense. There's a verse in this chapter that I'm going to speak on, and I'm going to challenge you, challenge myself about our spiritual Intelligence. There's lots of kinds of intelligence, isn't there? There's a kind of intelligence they measured for 11 plus, which measures a certain kind of intelligence, logical skills, reasoning. But there's lots of other kinds of intelligence. There's, you know, um, physical intelligence. They, they call it kin kin kinesthetic intelligence. That's what they call it, don't they? I gifted in that area. I could always catch balls. I could always run. I could always do those things naturally. I was always in the team. Um, I, I got that. Music, it's musical intelligence, it's spatial intelligence, you know. Can you back the car and know where things are and things like that? Can you read a map? Spatial intelligence, yeah. Lots of different kinds of intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is the most important for us. What kind of skills does spiritual intelligence require? The Bible's full of examples of people who was stupid spiritually. And surely the Lord gives us these examples in the Old Testament, particularly some in the New Testament, for us to learn from it. Um, now this passage, let me just make one or two comments on the passage. Why well, I asked Elizabeth, I was going to say Elizabeth, Lizzie to read, sorry, I'm not calling you Elizabeth. <laughs> I've not heard that. Right. I well, asked Lizzie to read uh, the first bit in chapter, the last bit of chapter nine. Was there you got spiritual blindness? The Pharisees were spiritually blind. People who haven't got spiritual intelligence are spiritually blind. And then the next bit, you know, um, they've got they're spiritually deaf. Look at uh, ten six. This figure of speech Jesus used to them, but they did not understand. What he was saying to them, they're deaf. They, they can't grasp it. They can't realise. They hear the words, but they're deaf. They're spiritually deaf. Um, and what about 10.13? He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The, the, the Pharisee hasn't got a relationship with the shepherd. He hasn't got a relationship with the shepherd. He is spiritually unrelated. And then if you go down further, 1019, um, that section there, division, many of them, he's a demon, others said that these are not the words of the one who was oppressed. That section there, well, there was a division because they didn't believe his words. They were spiritually, had spiritual unbelief. They did not believe what he said. That's the background. And in fact, the verse I'm going to deal with relates to the background. You know this passage so well. You've read it so many times. You think, oh dear, what can I learn from this tonight? Well, I think we can learn a lot from it. Now, the verse I'm going to speak on is verse 27. This section about my sheep hear my, my voice. My sheep, in comparison with those that are not his sheep. So I'm speaking to sheep tonight. So I could call this sheep skills tonight. What are the skills that we should have as sheep? My sheep, no one else's sheep. There's a division. You know there's a division. We had it this morning very clearly between the Christian and the non-Christian, between the blind and the who's spiritually speaking, and the person who has their eyes open, between the, the deaf and the person who can hear, the person that can't walk, who's lame, the person who can walk spiritually, there is a division. 
obviously a big division. My sheep hear, hear my voice. So the first skill, and it comes up in verse 4, 10, 4. Um, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Comes up at 16. Let's look at 16. Um, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. My voice. My sheep hear. Notice it's in the present tense. Now, there is a time when we heard. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. And sometimes the Lord does use it like that. He talks about them not being able to hear. And when we're converted, we hear. We hear with understanding and we come. But this says, my sheep hear. And one of the things that we should have as a skill in terms of spiritual intelligence is a hearing ear. We should not be deaf. I remember a few months ago going over to St Ives to have my ears syringed. I couldn't get in anywhere else. When I came out onto the road, it was deafening. It was deafening. And I was so deaf. And it's possible, spiritually speaking, to have wax in our ears and not to be hearing. Now, of course, it's not hearing the words we're talking about. It's what David was preaching about this morning. Not saying, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, I can tick the boxes. It's not about that. This is about action, hearing with action. Hearing with action. This is the fruit of hearing. This is a result of hearing. Now, Janice says, I don't listen to her. Do you have that, Colin? You do. Uh, you don't have that problem. I have a problem. Yeah, I have selective hearing. I think that perhaps, is that a male thing? I don't know. It is? All right, okay. Not a good thing, is it, to have selective hearing? But remember about the seed? Let's look at that. Let's look at Matthew 13. Look at Matthew 13. You know this parable so well. About the seed. In verse 13, sorry, chapter 13, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, you see, then it's like rocky ground. One who hears the word receives it with joy, yet has no root. Of course, it falls away. Verse 22, as for what is sown among thorns, Here's the word, but the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, choke the world. Verse 23, and that which is sown on good soil, that is the one who hears the word and understands it. Notice, he indeed, he indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, hundredfold, in another 60, in another 30. Hearing spiritually produces something. My sheep hear my voice. There's lots of other things that we listen to. Tradition's very powerful. The Lord had it in his day powerfully, didn't he? Oh, they were so careful about obeying the rules and regulations about washing their hands in a certain way when they had food or pots had to be washed in a certain way. The Lord said to you, You've made the word of God of no effect because of listening to tradition. I put the words in, I know, added to it. But you see, tradition, listening to that, not listening to the Lord, tradition, which is powerful. The Lord says this, this is what we've done. The very 
conflict with Christians, powerful conflict. What about strangers? The voice of strangers. Oh, yes. Some new idea, people listen to that. The voice of the Pope. Well, that's in Catholicism. It's not just in Catholicism. Christians can have popes. And what does this person say? What does this preacher say? My sheep hear my voice. The voice of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember the, um, do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? You've heard it said, but I say to you. you. See, but that's what it is with us, should be. What does he say? What is he saying? Um, Toza wrote a pamphlet called The Waning Authority of the Lord Jesus in the Churches. I don't know if you've ever read that pamphlet. And um, he says that hardly it's asked at all in evangelical churches, what does the Lord say? I wonder when was the last time you asked that. What does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? Well, in Matthew 7, can you turn to Matthew 7? Again, a familiar scripture. It's not for the Sunday school, this one. Verse 24 of Matthew 7. This is how <coughs> the Lord sums up his sermon. Everyone who hears these words of mine. Notice again. And does them. This is 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And the rock is the Lord Jesus and his words. He says this, whoever is ashamed of me and my words and God will be ashamed of him when he comes, when the Lord Jesus comes. And first go back to 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. It's for us, folks. It's for us. Are we building on what the Lord Jesus says? Spiritual? Spiritual intelligence. Not on creeds. Not on man-made things. Not on particular doctrines. Are we building it on what he says? Remember, and I'll finish up this point with it. Remember, when it comes to the last letter, in the seven letters in, in Revelation, we have this challenge. I personally think it's one of the strongest challenges in the Bible. There's this church that's weak and compromised. and they think they've got everything, and they've got little. And the Lord says to them, I'm knocking at your door. And if anyone among you, if any, hear my voice and open the door I'll come in and eat with them I think that challenge is for us the person I appreciate pointed out to me in a book very clearly that you know if anyone if anyone there's a kind of hint there that it's not going to be many respond if anyone hear my voice is Christ outside the church he was then, 30, 40 years after, 50 years, we don't know, but not long after the ascension. Challenging, isn't it? Listening skill. Are we listening? Now, Janice used to teach listening school skills when she was at school, didn't you? Listening skills. I think we should teach listening skills. Are you listening when you read your Bible? Are you listening? Or do you read it? Got this passage to do. You think, I've got this to do today. I've got that to do today. Are you listening? Are you devoting time to listening? Lord, I want to listen what you're going to say to me this morning or this evening. Are you listening? Are you there? You've got wax in your ears. So that's an important skill, listening. I 
feel that I need that word for myself. I'm sure I do. Second one is, let's go back to John. And so this, we're in John chapter 10. And my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And I know them. Now, during the reading tonight, I hadn't noticed it before, but look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. (coughs) I know my own, and my own know me. So what's the second skill? Well, it's the skill of relationship. This is an intimate word knowing. This is the skill of friendship. Is the Lord Jesus our intimate friend? It doesn't seem right saying that, does it, in a way? How can, how can the Lord of glory be our intimate friend? Oh, I know them. Not, I know about them. I know them. They're in relationship with me. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me. I know them. I know them. What's your skill? What what do you like at relationships? What do you like at friendship? Lots of different kinds of friends, aren't there? Some close friends, some more associates, some... Um, just people you know, different kind of friendship. But this here is a very, very close (coughs) friendship. It's about communion. It's about trust. It's about reliance. It's about a close relationship. It says in Proverbs, doesn't it? As a friend, a friend that love, a friend loves at all times. And that's what a friend does. A real close friend trusts you and loves you at all times, in all circumstances. Well, so much more the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> why does he love the unlovely? Why does he love those? Why is he in friendship? Why is he in communion with, with people like us? This is the most glorious thing, isn't it? He is. Now, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians... Um, no, no, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to refer to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When I was at university, this verse meant a lot to me. So, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. And it was due to a, a man called G.H. Lang, who was a, a brethren man who, in 1937, wrote a paper about the war. You know... Christians had conflict when the war came about whether they should fight or not. Christians disagreed with it. Some fought, some didn't. My father didn't. My father was a conscientious objector. Um, uh, there was a conflict among Christians about it. He, and the, this man, G.H. Lang, wrote a paper about it in 37, two years before the war, to prepare people, particularly young men. men. And this is the verse he used to start off his paper. It was this verse. Verse 9 of chapter 1. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I thought, I was thinking about this whole subject, I thought I could change that quite, quite rightly. I could put this. God is faithful by whom you were called into friendship of his son because fellowship is sharing it's partnership and that's what friendship is now I wonder if you think like that you see I think it's a real help to think in sanctification and that was the subject this morning how can we be more like Christ well you should think what would he do here I am in this situation what would the Lord Jesus do? And of course, that's what G.H. Lang was arguing in his paper. You see, what would he do? 
What would the Lord Jesus do? And the more you are in friendship, more in communion with him, the more you're in partnership with him. You see, husbands and wives here, they know what the other one's going to do. Well, the more we are in friendship, in communion with the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we shall be like him and do what he would do, which is different to the world, obviously. This is a wonderful skill, friendship. It's something that just doesn't happen. Some people haven't got it, you know. It, the the um, intelligence here is called interpersonal relationship intelligence. Emotional intelligence, that's what they talk about today. People have an emotion. Some people haven't got emotional intelligence. They can't develop friendships. It's awful, terrible. They've got no idea how to relate to other people. You can improve. You can work at it. Of course you can, like all these things you can improve. But you know, we should be concerned, are we in fellowship? Are we in f friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll finish my point here with a quote from the book, which is all about friendship, all about intimacy, all about love. What's that book? That's the book, The Song of Songs. In chapter 6, I think it is, there she is and she's describing, she's describing her, her lover, her partner. And she starts his head and says, oh. And she goes on about his head and his torso and she comes down to his legs and you have this wonderful description. She's really, you know, <laughs> taken up with it. And then she says, this is my lover. And this is my friend. Telling, isn't it? This is my lover. And this is my friend. The Lord Jesus Christ is our lover. And he's our friend. That's what we should develop. We should develop intimacy with him doesn't just come naturally. It takes time, like any relationship. It has to be worked at. It has to be sacrificed for. It has to be a priority. I'll leave it there. So first skill, are we listening? Are we in friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we developing that intimacy with him through prayer, through Bible reading, through fellowship, through communion, with him. Let's go on. I know them. My sheep hear my voice, yes. I know them. I'm in, I'm in relationship with them. And they follow me. And they follow me. I suppose we're talking about discipleship, aren't we? There's so many things that we're tempted to follow. And people do follow, and Christians do follow. But we ought to follow the Lord. Follow me. Now, there's issues. What obstacles get in the way of us following? And Peter was faced with it, wasn't he? Yes, I'll follow you. I'll die with you. And we know, and the Lord spoke to him again at that wonderful breakfast time three times, Peter, you follow me. Don't care about that man over there, Peter. Very personal. You follow me. Well, there are two passages. We haven't got time to deal with them tonight, but Luke 9 and, and Luke 14, which gives you the issues about discipleship. Luke um, 9, 53 to 60, and Luke 14, 25, in a few verses there. And the Lord says, you cannot be my disciple unless. You cannot be my disciple unless. Issues about discipleship. Issues about following the Lord. What hindrances can we have to following the Lord? And I thought, well, I'd write some down. Then I wondered, well, it's all very individual. Your hindrances are not my hindrances. I've got a personality. 
That's not your personality. Right? So I don't want to put my problems onto you. We're different. Everybody's different. But we've all got obstacles. We all know them. We all know the things that would stop us following the Lord Jesus Christ. Comfort, idols, friends, culture, family, getting up in the morning, priorities. These are the issues that we all know about. What about our skill? If we're going to follow somebody, it's serious. We make time. We think about it. We sacrifice. We prioritise. Well, I'll finish this little section on following me with this. There's a wonderful promise in, in, in chapter 8 of John. You know it, you can quote it. Um, and I can't quote it, I've got, got a senior moment and it's gone from my mind. Um, if anyone follows me, he will not walk in darkness. No, now I've got it wrong, haven't I? Chapter 8, dear, oh dear, there we are, let's look it up. Old age creeps on. Chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus said, yeah, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever, this is a promise, it's a challenge, will not walk in darkness. I think it's talking about the darkness of the world, the moral darkness of the world. Folks, if we're following the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not be like the world. It is a dark place. Talking to Jenny this morning. It is a dark place. It's a morally dark place. If anyone follows the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not walk in darkness, but you'll have the living light, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Himself. So with the skill of following him. Oh Lord, we pray, don't we, we might follow him more earnestly, more sincerely, more keenly. And last of all, the last skill here. So back to John chapter 8. My sheep here, my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, <clears throat> and I give them eternal life, and they'll never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What's this skill? And this is the most difficult skill. When you're talking about school, kids learning, there's lots of skills you can actually teach them, but this one is a most difficult one. It's the most advanced skill, and it's appreciation. It's thankfulness. It's valuing what is important. You know, you can't really teach those things, can you? And I give them eternal life. What's the Lord given us? Do we appreciate it? Do we wonder at it? This is what we had this morning. We had that the Lord has saved us, but there's so much more for us. Well, I give unto them eternal life, and they'll not perish. In the first chapter of John, there's a wonderful word about this subject. And chapter 1 says this, it's, I think it's verse 14, yeah. No, verse 17. For the law was given through Mo Moses, grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got to go back a bit further, sorry. Yeah, um, verse 16. Um, for from his fullness... We have all received grace upon grace. What? Received of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his fullness, grace upon grace. Now, when we're going, to, we're going down to South Sea, God willing, the end of the week, I like to go and look at the waves. It's, and then they come. I've given this illustration before, but it helps me. As... I see the waves, sometimes they're rough and they're coming. Sometimes they're gentle, but they come in and they come in and they come in and they come in and they come in. Grace 
upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. Do we appreciate it? Have we got that skill of appreciating thankfulness, what the Lord Jesus has done for us in reconciling us, in forgiving us, in saving us, in presenting us perfect before the Father? Do we, I confess, do we comprehend these things? Do we appreciate these things? Of his fullness, you have all received. What a wonderful, glorious thing that is. Perhaps a verse in, in uh, Romans 8 that we had this morning might be helpful. Romans 8, 32 says this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, up for us all, how will he not also with him, with him, graciously give us all things? All things. We need one more verse to help us. Because how can we understand these things? gone I've been a Christian now 60 years in many ways I don't seem to have made much progress in what I'm talking about up here now how can I be helped how can you be helped and surely only God can do this and if you go to 1 Corinthians it tells you plainly 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2 says this Chapter 2 says this. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about appreciating what the Lord has given us. I give unto them spiritually discerned. Okay, and if you go to 13, 13, um, no, sorry, um, verse 12, sorry, verse 12. <clears throat> now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might, under, here we are, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Folks, we can. We can. It says it here. We have the Spirit so that we can understand. We can understand these things to some extent. We should ask and pray on that verse. Lord, give me understanding. Give me comprehension. Give me thankfulness for what you've done. How can we thank you if we don't understand? And what a wonderful skill this is. The skill of realisation for what the Lord has done. Awareness, valuing that I have given them, I have given them eternal life and no one will pluck them out of my hand. Well, four simple skills. <laughs> listening. Are we listening? Are we developing it? Relational skills, are we seeking a deeper and closer relationship with the Lord Jesus? Are we seeking to follow him? Follow him? And are we seeking to appreciate more, value more what he has done? I want to just finish by... Um, I can find a hymn in here. Yes. If you have your hymn book, I know it's 801. This is Horatius Bonner, little hymn. Not what I am, O Lord, but what you are. Your love, not mine, commands my doubt depart. This, this alone dispels my lurking fear and stills the tempest of my anxious heart. 801, okay, verse 2. 
Your name is love. I hear it from the cross. Your name is love. I read it in the tomb. All lesser love is perishable dross. But this shall light me through time's deepest gloom. All that I know of you, my Lord and God, shall fill my soul with peace, my lips with song. You are my health, my joy, my staff and rod. Leaning on you in weakness, I am strong. More of yourself. Oh, show me hour by hour. More of your glory, oh my God and Lord. More of yourself in all your grace and power. More of your love and truth, incarnate word. So we'll sing our last hymn, which is seven five seven. Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. You'll see that many of the things I've been talking about tonight are in this hymn. Um, Be thou for ever near me my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side. You see, nor wander from the pathway follow, you see, if thou wilt be my guide. Thank you, Alan.
please, may the word tonight affect our souls, and our hearts, and our lives. We thank you for all that we do have. We want to appreciate him, all that we have in the Saviour, all that he's done and will do for us. Help us in this coming week to live it out. May we indeed grow in grace in this coming week and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Amen.